Good morning. I'm Pastor Truelock from Quimby and Bethsaida United Methodist Churches. We're coming to you now from Quimby where the service is already underway. We appreciate you tuning in. My message this morning, maybe one of the most important ones I've preached, especially in a long time. The name of it is that name is above it, that name, the name that is above every name. And of course that name is Jesus. Now, I had the Apostles' Creed in the bulletin this morning, very intentional, and I'm asked Mary Ann to put it in there for a while yet. When I was growing up, we had the Apostles' Creed every Sunday morning in the Little Methodist Church in Lynchburg, and I learned it, I just absorbed it without even having to think about it, and it's still with me today, and it's important that we know that and know what we believe. Uh, somebody asked you, you know, what do y'all believe at Quimmin? Methodist Church, the United Methodist Church. What would you tell them? You know, all the controversy, they hear all the bad things about the church nowadays, but what would you actually tell them that we believe? This Apostles' Creed says what we believe. And the reason I wanted to take time to say just to mention that to you is remind you that we believe firmly in the Trinity. So my preaching this morning primarily on Jesus is not taking away from that, okay? They all go together. But today I want to concentrate on Jesus, and I hope you all will follow along. My scripture I want to start with is found in Philippians 2nd chapter, verses 9 through 11. And this is what Paul wrote. He says, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name of Jesus, that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so today's message is very simple, but I said it's very important. Today I'm going to be talking about Jesus. Now, we learn about him in the Gospels, and I want to go through a few very familiar passages of Scripture there. This won't take me very long. But in the Gospels, we start off with the Gospel of Matthew, which was written to the Gentiles. And the angel spoke these words to Joseph, Matthew 1 and 21. It says, She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All of these words are important. Jesus means to save. So that's what we were told in Matthew. That's what the Gentiles were to read. In Matthew 1, 23, just a couple of verses down, we'll get a little more information about it. It says, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. So that gives you another picture there of Jesus. And then in Luke, which was the message to Mary, when the angel spoke to her, Luke 1 and 31, this is what she heard. You will conceive and you will give birth to a son and you are to call him Jesus, which is Greek for Joshua, which means Jesus saves. Now you remember that Joshua in the Old Testament, uh, his name meant to save and he helped Moses as they led the Israelites out of Egypt and into the promised land. So that's where the saved comes in. But then in John 1, 1 through 18, we get a little more information here as to how it all ties together and how, where the Emmanuel comes in. And we're getting this rest of the story, as Paul Harvey would say, by looking at John 1, verses 1 through 18. I'm not going to read every verse in this, but I'm going to read most of them and comment on a few of them. John 1, 1 through 18. And it begins like this. In the beginning was the Word. What does that sound like to you? Could I possibly be reading from the Old Testament? In the beginning. Isn't that the way the Bible starts out? It's not an accident here that John put in this. In the beginning was the Word. And we'll see as I go through, the Word was Jesus. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Repeated it. Must be important, you think? 
Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. Light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Don't you like the light better than the darkness? Yeah. Remember the other day sitting up in the house when the clouds rolled in and the rain was beginning to start? It really got dark outside. The darker it got outside, I think the more light I turned on inside. We like the light, don't we? So you've got somebody to go bring us light. I want to learn about that person. And that's who the writer John says Jesus is. And then verse 6, it talks about John the Baptist who Old Testament prophecy had told there was going to be one who would come ahead of Jesus that would prepare the way for him, and that was John the Baptist. So the writer here takes some time to talk briefly about John the Baptist, and then you get into verse 9 of this John 1. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet, to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. That's where we come in. What a blessing. Don't you think we ought to know about this man, Jesus? We ought to know about this man, Jesus. He was in the world, but the world didn't recognize him. What a tragedy. He came to that which was his own, but... Did not, they did not receive him. Yet, all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or of a husband's will, but born of God. And that's somebody I want to know more about. This goes on in verse 14. It says, the word became flesh. It's obvious we're talking about Jesus. If you thought I was reading something extra into it up in the beginning. In the beginning was the Word, and I said, that's Jesus. Verse 14, I tell you, the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And we're going to see how important that verse is when it starts talking about grace and truth. Then verse 15, he goes back and he mentions John the Baptist again. He says, John testified concerning him. And John cried out saying, this is the one that I spoke about when I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Now they knew who John was. They'd been hearing him preach for a while. And John says, almost like I told you so. This is the one I've been talking about. The people were waiting to come on the scene. Uh, so that out of his fullness, we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given for Moses. Now they would have known all about the law. Moses gave the law, the Ten Commandments. And we know that the law was given. If we had to get in heaven based on the law, not a one of us would make it. Not one of us would make it. So here he writes, he says that, you know, the law was given through Moses. But grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God but the one and only Son, who is himself God. Remember, we talked about the word Emmanuel, God with us. Here he says, the one and only Son, who is himself God, and is in closest relationship with the Father, has known him. What's the most familiar passage of Scripture that goes along with that? Remember John 3, 16, what it says? God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. It's talking about Jesus. He came from the Father. He's God's Son. Now, if I wanted to take time and preach on all the different names of Jesus, we couldn't get through it in a year. But I'm going to share a few of them with you. And the reason for that, because the names tells us more about him. It tells us more about his character, who he is, and why he, why he came. The first one, obviously, is Jesus, which means uh, Jesus saves. 
Next one is God with us. That's Emmanuel. I've already mentioned that to you. Then we get to the Messiah. That's a very common one to hear. The record of genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And scripture says here in John 1 and 40, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard John and followed him. He first found his own brother Simon and told him, we have found the Messiah, which means the anointed one. And he brought Simon to Jesus. Later, John, the woman said, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. And then Christ gives us the name. Read about, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. That was Peter's quote. And it goes on, and then the one that I probably like one of the best, the way, the truth, and the life. Who called him that? Who said he was the way, the truth, and the life? Jesus. Say it louder, honey. Jesus. Jesus said that about himself. Must be true. You remember that? I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Folks, if we want to get to heaven, we might ought to know this man, Jesus. That's about as clear as it gets. I am the way. I am the truth and the life. There is no other way. No, you're not going to get there any other way. He said that to his disciples, and he's saying that to us, John 14 6. No one comes to the Father except through me. So he is the way, the only way. Another word that we call use for him is Savior. Savior. It says, for today in the city of David there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. That's Luke 2, 11. David has, says, has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Folks, we need a Savior. We have no other way to get in, do we? Have no other way to get in. It's referred to as the only begotten Son, the Lord, which meant teacher, wonderful. Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. That's the Old Testament scripture, Isaiah 96. For a child will be born for us, a son will be given to us, and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, and Prince of Peace. That's Isaiah 96. They knew about him long before he came on the scene. It's called a mediator. The light of the world, John 8. I am the light of the world. Anyone who follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. That's what Jesus said about himself also. You don't have to take somebody else's word for it. It's who he is. And then I like this, this, uh, this next one. You remember when Moses was going into Egypt to talk with Pharaoh and he says, who am I supposed to tell the Pharaoh has sent me? And God just simply tell him I am. Just tell him I am. And Jesus said these words in John 8, I assure you before Abraham was, I am. Jesus also called himself the I am. That's as complicated as it's hard to get in it. I am. He said, I am has sent me and now here Jesus shows up on the scene, I am. So then we call him the he's, the, he's the good shepherd. And the list goes on and on and on. We have these words in John 10 and 9. And these are Jesus' words also. He says, I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Aren't you glad he was willing to do that? Amen. We're the sheep. He's the good shepherd. He was willing to lay down his life for us. There, there are more. He's been called faithful. He's the bread of life. The Alpha and Omega, which is the beginning of the end, comes at the end of the Bible in Revelation. But he has all these names, and each one of us just tells him a little bit more about him. A little bit more about him. But I'm afraid we don't take time sometimes to give as much thought as we should to Jesus. If we call ourselves Christians, and we're the church, 
What more do we have to talk about? Who more do we have to talk about than Jesus, the Son of God? If we can't talk about Him, if we can't make it about Him, what are we doing? Really, what are we doing? There's a song that I like, and some of you think I have us sing it too often. So sit back, because I'm going to you're going to hear it again. I don't think you really listen to the words of it. Anybody want to guess what it is? Victory in Jesus. I'm going to read it this time. I started to sing, but I, I don't want to sing it. I want you to listen to the words of this song, what we say, are actually saying when we sing it. We get all wrapped up in the music. Me too sometimes. But listen to what this song says. I heard an old, old story how Savior came from glory. How he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning of his precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sins and won the what? The victory. the victory. He paid the price so I would get the victory. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing how he made the lame to walk again and caused the blind to see. And then I cried, Dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Third verse. I heard about, I don't know, I like this one. I heard about a mansion. Don't you like mansions? I heard about a mansion that he has built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea. About the angels singing in the old redemption story. And some sweet day I'll sing up there. The song of victory. And then the chorus of it is, Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me. Have you ever thought about what he says there? Huh? He sought me. I should have been seeking him and he sought me. For what purpose? So he could die in my place. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, before I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. So yes, there's victory in Jesus. And we need to spend more time talking about Jesus. There's a song, and I'm not going to sing this one either, but we all know it. There's something about that name. It's a Gaither song. And I've used this once before a long time ago. There's a monarch log that goes with that that Gloria wrote and she quotes it and I can't do it like Gloria Gaither does. I'd encourage you to go home and find it online and listen to her do this because it's worth your time. But this is what she says. This could be any of us. Jesus, the mere mention of his name, can calm the storm, heal the broken, raise the dead. At the name of Jesus I've seen hardened men melted Derelicts transform. The lights of hope are put in the eyes of a hopeless child. At the name of Jesus, hatred and bitterness turn to love and forgiveness. Arguments cease. I've heard a mother softly breathe his name at the bedside of a child delirious from fever. And I've watched that little body be quiet. Feeling brow cool. I've sat at the bedside of a dying saint her body racked with pain, who in those final fleeting seconds summoned her last ounce of every strength just to whisper her sweetest name, Jesus, Jesus. Emperors have tried to destroy it. Philosophers have tried to stamp it out. Tyrants have tried to wash it from the face of the earth with the very blood of those who claimed it. Yet it will stand. And there shall be that final day when every voice that has ever uttered a sound, every voice of Adam's race shall raise in one, shall raise in one mighty chorus to proclaim the name of Jesus. For that day every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is truly Lord. Ah, so you see, it's not mere chance that caused the angel one night long ago 
to say to a virgin maiden, his name shall be called Jesus. The question for us today is, do you know Jesus? That's the question. I've got some more of them. How about this one? Do you love him? Say you know him. Do you love him? Does he have a special place in your heart? Not just something when you talk about, but does he have a special place in your heart? In other words, is he part of you? Does he come first in your life? If he came first in everybody's life, the churches would be full this morning. That's my next question. Do you actually love his church? See, man didn't create the church. Peter didn't start the church because he preached at Pentecost. Church was God's plan. This is Jesus' doing. This is his church, his body. Do you love his church? Is it an important part of your life? If it's not, you've got a problem. Or are you striving to make disciples for him? It's the last thing he told us to do. Pretty simple command, wasn't it? Go out and make disciples for me. Is Jesus' most important word that you know? Quite possibly should be. Quite possibly should be. That's why I shared the Trinity with you in the beginning. All three are important. important. Jesus is sitting there in the middle. We can't get to heaven where the God is without going through Jesus' family. The Holy Spirit calls us to be saved, but until we accept Jesus, we can't have the Holy Spirit move into us, and we need him. So that puts Jesus right in the middle. I'd say that makes him pretty important. Not taking away anything from the, from the Trinity. But we need to give more thought to Jesus. We need to get into the Word and learn everything that we possibly can about him. We should look at our own lives, each and every one of us, and see if he's getting in a appropriate amount of time of our time each and every day are we doing the things that would please him he is our lord he is our savior and we need to always remember this jesus 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 there's just something special about that name In the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit amen I'm going to ask Pastor Lee Smith to play. We're going to have our usual altar call. The altar is open, or you can pray in your seats. For those of you who are watching on YouTube or Facebook, I hope you know Jesus. I hope you've been saved. If you haven't, you can do that today. All you've got to do is just pause what you're doing. Ask him to come into your life, forgive your sins, and just come into your life, and he'll do that. I hope and trust that you've got a church home of your own. If you do, I'd encourage you to be in that church home. If you don't, we'd invite you to worship with us at Queen at 11 o'clock on Sunday mornings. I've been saved out at Effingham at 9.30, but you need to be in church someplace. As I said in my sermon, church is God's doing. It's not some man or some preacher. This is what God created for us because he knew we would need to come together to draw strength from each other and have a place to worship him. So, until next time, may God richly bless you.